hello everyone. Great pleasure to be here with you. Um, and today we're going to be talking about assessment for the future. Yeah, I see lots of hellos there. Hello from Lith Lithuania, from Peru, from uh, Panama, Slovakia, Georgia. Thank you so much, Vietnam. Lots of people from many parts of the world, right? Uh, Kazakhstan, Vladivostok, Russia, Armenia. Uh, wow, Colombia, El Salvador. Um, well, Spain. So I was going to say hello in, in Spanish. Buenas tardes a todos. Um, in Portuguese, boa tarde. That's, that's really lots of people there. So assessment for the future. Um, I have... Um, you know, some slides here for you for us to get started. And I will just keep checking the, the chat box there for us to uh, to chat, all righty. Um, hello from Indonesia and from the Ukraine there, from many, many places, um, the Emirates as well. I mean, so many people from so many different parts of the world. That's so cool. So share your experiences, you know, how do you see assessment today? And do you think there's room for improvement? I would like to hear from, from your experiences. What, what do you think about the way assessment is run and uh, organized in your country? You know, what are your experiences? Uh, tell me a little bit more about online teaching and, and how, how do you assess? So um, terribly difficult. <laughs> indeed, indeed, right? Because, uh, oh, um, Nasan, uh, well, it's going fast. Wait, let's see. He says here, assessment is an ongoing process. We shouldn't only focus on production in terms of language learning. Yeah, I agree with you. It's an ongoing process. That's, that's the beauty of assessment. So that's the thing. When we think about assessment, a lot of times we treat assessment as the end result, the outcome. We think about it being part of the end, the, the, um, the very moment where everything comes to a conclusion and it doesn't have to be that way, right? You could totally use assessment throughout the whole process and it doesn't have to be formal. You can always um, use assessment in order to change things slowly but surely and adapt and gauge the way you teach. So yes, it is an ongoing process because it is not about my teaching, it's about their learning. So how, how do I adjust things like my syllabus? How do I adjust my guidelines, my lesson aims, the strategies based on what I'm receiving? Uh, uh, because that's the thing, I mean, what do we have? We have information. So information is, you know, everywhere. We have to get the information, get the data, and then do something with the data, right? So what do we do with this data? We can uh, help students by, um, you know, promoting change so they have better learning outcomes, or we can just wait till the end and then apply uh, an ass uh, assessment just to, to make sure that things were right. And then, you know, it might be way too late for students to, to act or to do something about it. So that's why it's so important for us to really treat assessment in a way that it is ongoing. So I agree with you there. Um, strengths, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, with assessment, uh, Andora Visha, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but um, basically you have that, right? You have the fact that you do notice what people get out of a, a, a syllabus, right? So that's usually, when we think about assessment, we think about just the typical uh, summative assessment because it's the whole sum. Uh, you're basically analyzing your syllabus and you're thinking, well, out of everything that I've presented, they've grasped 70% of what I've presented. And, uh, but the, the thing is, what do you do with that? You know, that's, that's, Something that is controversial with assessment is just, do you change your teaching practices based on the results of exams, you know? So because of that conundrum, because of that dichotomy, we, we can act 
So yes, it's totally okay to have summative assessment, but what if we could, in order to get there, have certain steps, certain stages, and then be more about not the formal number, but be more about observations and monitoring and analysis, what we call like diagnose, right? Uh, diagnosing. Um, let's see, it's, it's, assessment is time consuming for sure. Um, that's the thing you really have to think about because it has to be fair, right? It has to reflect uh, what the classroom is all about, what the education, what the process entails, okay? Uh, the circumstances, someone is saying here, uh, Benjamin, uh, maybe Benjamin Chavez, he's saying that it's difficult due to the circumstances, for sure. You know, we are all, you know, facing the uh, challenges right now, and um, unfortunately, we have to compromise and, and change our practices somehow. But that's okay. For us, you know, as teachers, we can totally adapt. And how do we adapt? We use technology to our advantage, okay? Some students only worry about passing, so that's the thing. I mean, that, that you cannot control. But the thing is, you can engage, so that's the thing. Yes, you're talking about stakes, right? Exams are high stakes. Exams are very um, important in society because most of the time you take an exam because you need to pass either you know, uh, your school year, you need to um, prove to society that you've reached a certain threshold, a certain level. So it is high stakes and you have the stakeholders, uh, you know, parents, teachers, institutions, students. Uh, however, the learning process is more than that. The learning process involves knowing more about yourself, knowing more about the others, collaborating, thinking about things, discussing. So all these things are learning opportunities. So some people might think, yeah, the exam is just my, my, my target. But they will notice that throughout the process, they will have many more targets. Targets um, that are related to your personal life, targets that are related to uh, the skills that you've developed. Uh, some people are saying here, Angela Ortega Rodriguez is saying that, yes, it is about like the red tape or it is about the technical aspects or the official. So that's the thing. We all have to have standards, right? Standards are part of life. So you have to have guidelines, benchmark, standards, that's fine. But we have to somehow find ways to explore beyond those realms, you know, beyond the limits of summative assessment or government assessment in a way that the journey gives you many more opportunities. Okay, so teaching remotely, yeah, that's a challenge for sure. Um, and then someone is talking about written exams. Yeah, for, for um, teaching remotely, we're gonna talk about it um, throughout the presentation. But basically you have to think, well, there you have written production and you have spoken production, right? So with writing, for example, yeah, why should we wait to evaluate writing formally? I mean, there are tons of ways to use social media or social media like features in order for students to start contributing with writing, okay? Um, same with speaking. So I, I usually say, use technology to your advantage. So let's think about an email, for example. And the email is just a, a, a handy uh, tool for us to work with writing uh, vocabulary, grammar, uh, or defending a point of view. And it doesn't have to be an evaluation. It is, a, it is, it is an opportunity. So that's the thing. Um, we have to think about situations like classroom situations as opportunities for us to reflect and for us to give feedback to students and in the midst of the process we're going to be able to analyze things from a more technical or formal perspective so if i have an activity where students are uh, preparing an email or preparing um, a video or uh, recording audio to uh, their group 
all these opportunities are uh, very worthwhile and, 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 and we have to look into them instead of just thinking about the formal moment where they're going to be evaluated because you have stress, right? I mean, you have to take into consideration the fact that someone who memorizes things sometimes um, has a, an easier time with certain tasks. So when you contemplate the whole process, you give people more chances and opportunities for them to revisit the content, for them to make the content their own. So you're embracing creativity, you're embracing collaboration, communication, critical thinking. It's always about confidence. If the student is not confident, it's very, very tough for us to help them. Because that's the thing, as a teacher, I'm thinking, how can I help this group? So if they have to go through various hurdles in life, and let's say that the exam is one of the first hurdles, I mean, it's part of life. Life, you know, you measure success through numbers, especially with jobs, university, um, government, titles, things like that. Eh? So, I mean, we cannot really do much about it. We have to face the abyss, right? When the, the abyss is right there, uh, it's not a problem. The, the thing is, how are we prepared for everything? Not only the technical aspects. And how much help did we get throughout the process? How much structure, foundation do we have? Not only, like I said, in terms of like language, because the exam is just one part. What people really should focus on is um, enjoying and cherishing all the opportunities that you have in the classroom to use to your advantage. Okay. Okay. So, oh, all right. Well, I got, I got a question here. How can we deal with students when you assign a test, but they don't do it using their own learning, but someone else, someone else is the same with any other activity. How do we deal with students when you assign a test, but you don't do it? You, oh, okay, okay. When they appropriate, like, right, when, they, when they're when they just seizing somebody else's thoughts, let's say with writing, okay? Uh, I, would, I would try to entice, try to engage and fire up their curiosity in terms of motivating. So I would say, um, find your own voice. So that's the thing. I mean, obviously... You would have to build upon that idea. But as a teacher, you have the opportunity to be a, a mentor, right? To be a facilitator. So it's like when you're using somebody else's work, it is in a way plagiarism, right? You're appropriating yourself from someone else's ideas. And in a way, if you do that as inspiration, you do it like Isaac Newton, you know, when he said that he was standing on the shoulder of giants. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't have done all the things that he did if it weren't for the, the people that came before him. And he used that as inspiration. So it is totally okay to use it as inspiration. So you have to show students. And that's the thing. Make learning visible. When you show things uh, visually, it's really powerful. So if you associate stealing ideas to bad things, to bad analogies, that will trigger thoughts and images for anyone, for any human being. And they will feel like distancing themselves from that image, you know? And, and, but then you provide opportunities for them to really find their own voice. Let me give an example. I mean, maybe they're not too keen on uh, um, an argumentative essay, like, whoa, give me your position on uh, free health care. And they don't want to talk about it in a way, right? Because sometimes we do have those situations. So prepare them as they go along, but not really evaluating, but then just as opportunities, learning opportunities to give them feedback so they will practice and they will develop universal aspects which uh, which are related to how do you convey your idea how do you want to convey your idea when it, when you're totally free to convey it how would you do it would you do it through images through words through music how do you express your your thoughts you know and then you 
use analogies and you make learning visible in a way you, you try to uh, produce, use art, communicate, externalize, okay? Let me uh, check the other question here. Do you have us any sample of assessment form to record the skills of the student? Yeah, so usually for us to deal with skills, we usually follow a curricula, right? It could be uh, any curriculum that uh, is skills-based, uh, that follows, like it could be Council of Europe, it could be uh, LOMC, it could be from any country. As long as you're really focusing on the can-dos, focusing on performance, and not only focusing on, on what has been taught. I mean, oh, this has been taught, how much has this person grasped from this content? Instead of like, oh, the student can do this, can perform that. So I would just check the curriculum, the international curricula and the curriculum from your country. Uh, the Common European Framework is all about can-dos as well. Um, and yeah, so it would have to be something within those lines. What do you think about, uh, yeah, do you think it's more common? Uh, yes, I believe that assessment that is done in, in, in these situations where you don't really think that you could assess people, but you're gauging. So that's the thing. It's about like gauging. It's a buffer, you know? Um, example, let's pretend that uh, I'm, I'm going to interview my students and I ask them about their personal lives. You know, they tell me about their personal lives without really worrying about the grammar, the vocabulary. I get an initial idea on how they're doing how they're conveying their ideas. And I'm at the same time checking their spoken production. Are they hesitating? Are they using, you know, fillers, um, not using anything? So what, what's happening, you know? And it's not a, 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 an opportunity like official right now for me to assess. It's mostly I'm creating the opportunities based on the information. So I'm just using overall information to gauge this situation, all right? Perfect. So let's um, let's see. So we started with that question here. Another one. Do you think assessment is used for competition, collaboration? Does it bring real evidence of learning, and does it integrate motivation? So I'm going to try and be faster to answer to try and get more people because we have many many good questions here. Uh, yeah, very young learners. Somebody's asking me here. Maybe. Don Rita Kaplani, maybe. Um, so, yes, how can we assess and evaluate very young learners through online teaching? So that's the thing. First thing that you got to decide, is this going to be summative or is it going to be formative? Obviously, for very young learners, it's all about formative. We want to help them and we want to, like, be mentors and facilitators, right? So we would have checklists. And online, what you can do is use the environment that you have with technology, with video and audio, for them to be able to find opportunities to produce together. I mean, obviously, collaboration is hindered. Somehow, you, you cannot have like a perfect circle time for very young learners. You cannot have like routines the same way that you're used to, but you can adapt, right? You can adapt, use video, use audio, um, ask students to, uh, to collaborate, and most of the time, they will collaborate uh, especially with very young learners, and you should have like a checklist of can-dos, right? And in that fashion, you would slowly but surely, every maybe week, every month, you would gauge how things are progressing and if you should change the way you teach. So that's the thing. When you talk about formative assessment, it's always about changing the way that you teach, in order for you to help students, and it's different than summative assessment where you do, you're not going to change your teaching practice. It's pretty much going to be like, okay, this is the time for me to evaluate how much they've grasped out of the content. Uh, how can we create a good environment to make uh, improvisation? Well, by stimulating creativity, by um, promoting critical thinking. Uh, for example, with course books, you always have an opportunity for uh, storytelling, for texts, right? Uh, ask them to think about the story. Ask them uh, to personalize the story to their reality, 
you know? So I, I do that a lot. I, um, whenever we tell a story, we say, hey, what if this, what if, you know, let's think that you were the author. Let's pretend that you were writing the story. How would you change it? And why would you change it? So uh, embrace higher order thinking skills. Why, how, more than what and where. Okay, so what is the name of the character? Where is the story placed? Um, these things are all fine and dandy, but they're mostly about just the ability to look for information. That is a skill, the ability to break down information. But what about how and why? Being able to try and find the, the cog behind the whole, the gears, you know, just thinking about the system and uh and giving your contribution so that's in order for you to embrace creativity you have to ask people to contribute so you're more like um uh, like like i said you know the facilitator and it is totally okay to have different opinions to have like debates and to uh promote um you know just communication like i said the four c's communication collaboration critical thinking right uh, I'm missing one, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creativity. I think I got them all. If I didn't, uh, <laughs> sorry. So let's see the next question here. Any products from Macmillan that you would recommend? Yes, for sure. We have Global Stage for uh, young learners. I would say Share It, uh, Story Central, and Global Stage, depending on your goals. I mean, if, if you want to really focus on storytelling, you could go to uh, go with Story Central. If you want to uh, focus on social and emotional learning, you could go with Share It. And uh, if you want literacy, like a really full on course on literacy, you could go with Global Stage. So it depends on the outcomes. But that's the beauty of assessment. You know, whenever you're thinking about a group, you're already thinking about assessment in terms of learning outcomes, in terms of what you want it for uh, oral production written production, students, for example, producing authentic videos, creating. Everyone, I don't know, I mean, there are people from many parts of the world, but today it is the era of content creation. This is like the moment for people to have their voices heard through social media, through the internet. It could be even within your family, your group of friends, but it is much easier for you to have your voice heard. You can use WhatsApp, you can go to a group, and then you can just tell everybody what you think. So we are facing many opportunities for people to really produce, for people to create, right, content. So does it bring real evidence of learning? For sure, because we are using all of the opportunities that we have in order for us to keep going. Does it integrate motivation? Yes, but that's the thing if you do the formative aspect as well, because you are forming, you are working for learning, not only about the learning itself, like assessment of learning, it's assessment for learning, okay? A um, Couple more questions here. Wow, there are so many questions. Um, wait, let's see. Real evidence of learning. Yeah, like we were talking about, right now, eh? Uh, just the fact that we um, we can show because they, they can do things. So it's learning by doing. If they're doing, if they're recording an interview, if, if they if they create a podcast, if they work on a project, it is materialized and externalized. The ideas are there, right? So, and like I said, you know, because we're focusing on the performance, then assessment is actually like presenting itself in a very creative way. Uh, I like that Stella. Stella is saying about just implicitly doing it, right? So they're not even aware. It's just like when you ask people about like linguistics, when uh, in linguistics you have informant, right? When you're analyzing the way people pronounce words or the way people use accents, uh, you know, like let's say um, when you say, well, where is the... Uh, apparel department and somebody tells you like fourth floor or they say fourth floor things like that without even thinking 
Uh, that's actually a study from uh, the 70s. You know, William, William LaBob did that in New York. So uh, to see like the so social stratification of accents in New York, if people said fourth floor or if they said fourth floor, uh, and based on that, he, they didn't know. And then when he asked them to say it again, now what was that? They were more conscious of like, oh my God, maybe I did, I said something wrong. So when, when you're more conscious, you police yourself. And that's what happens with assessment. That's, that's what happens to, uh, to assessment scenarios. You know, you're like policing yourself. You're all worried about, so you have the stress factor. And whenever you're doing it implicitly, like, you know, diagnosing and acting and monitoring and, and doing and, and working with feedback, then you're providing the opportunities that are more au naturel, right? I mean, uh, it's more like you go with the flow and you let students really at ease, à l'aise, okay? Um, let's see what else here. Um, what can we do if the students don't do the task? That's challenging. And like I said, it is regarding the code of conduct, right? Whenever we have a, a classroom situation, a social situation, we have to abide by the code of conduct. It's like a mini company. It's like a mini society. So students have to understand that they're part of society. And within the educational society, we have the code of conduct where we have guidelines. And one of the guidelines is to, to do the tasks, to uh, show up on time, I mean, you could find various ways. We could think about various ways, like gamification could be a possibility, rewarding. So you reward people for the things that they've done um, in various ways. And it doesn't have to be something material. It could be just an idea, like a badge, right, a medal. And... Um, I believe that a lot of students are going to be compelled. They're going to be like, oh, you know what? I'm actually going to go for it. Um, if they don't do it, yes. I mean, there are consequences. There are various ways. It depends on the schools of thought. It will be definitely regarding the context. Sometimes uh, it could be harder. Sometimes it could be like something simpler. But uh, I would say you could try and use like gamification strategies to help out, you could negotiate, but then it's always related to the tools that you have, the choices that you give them, and the trust relationship. So learning is about uh, interaction. Humans interact. I mean, everything is about social interactions, right? Politics, um, relationships, like human contact, human interaction, sorry. So yes, if, if you have that, you have compliance. And you need to have some sort of compliance in order for people to function. So you could try and think about these strategies that I've mentioned. Hopefully, it will help out. Um, all right. Performance assessment versus multiple choice tests. Um, more, you're saying that, do you think it will be more important? It's hard to pinpoint as more important because there's so much that could happen within the umbrella of more important. But I would say for certain contexts, students could benefit more from, from um, performance assessment in a way like projects, you know? Certain students could do really well with projects because they like to work with other people. They like to, um, to create. So let's say, for example, the water it needs to be cooler for the water fountain of the school, you know, and then some students are going to be like, hey, we have to come up with ideas or maybe the bus shelter has to be better because it protects people from the rain. And then they're going to work on a project. So that way, in order for you to evaluate performance and to see all the skills that are required for them to do that, it's going to be better within that context as opposed to other times where you do need multiple choice, like that you're going to have to present people with choices that you've picked. Uh, it's not about that. That is still information. My, my, my pet peeve is when multiple choice is itself the end, you know, is itself the goal. Then I see no, 
uh, I, in my opinion, I might be wrong, but I just see no purpose. I, I just think, okay, I can present information via multiple choice, but um, I can think about the feedback that I will do. I will, you know, think about something that can be worked with the data. So I'm collecting data via multiple choice, but it's always going to be just more data for me to help students in a different way. Um, so never the means in, or the end. It's just, just the tools for me to establish choices uh, for future endeavors. Okay, so Marcella wants to assess with numbers. So that's quantitative assessment, right? You're trying to find ways to truly uh, gauge. But, you, okay, that's totally valid. However, a lot of people pose that there is no truth in numbers either. That it's, it's I mean, that's that could be controversial, but it, in a way, you've picked the parameters. You know, you're always... There is always some bias to the the to, for, from the outset, you know. Um, either way, if you want to use numbers, which could be totally valid and are valid in various contexts, um, that then you would just um, find ways to evaluate the skills, right? F find ways to evaluate the performance, and just. Using uh, statistics, you could go like ranking, you could do uh, grading, and uh, you could just present various numbers. But that's the thing. Like I said, with human sciences, it's very hard to do like truly quantitative. It's going to be like, in a way, qualitative attached to figures. Still, it's, it's, it's done everywhere, um, and it's actually standard. You know, it's the summative assessment that's done with bands and, and ranges. And, uh, yeah, it does tell you uh, information. It does give you uh, information. It is information being interpreted. However, it is just that. And what does the student do with that? You know, where does the student go if they got 70%, you know? What do we do with the uh, 30%? Could it, could that, could it, could if, could I look and, and, and analyze that info in order for me to better help the student? So that's what, what I'm trying to convey here. Um, so with the Inda Yi Yoko, examples of assessment for learning. Yes, ongoing assessment. So it could be, uh, like I said, interview, quiz, questionnaire, out of the blue stuff in the classroom that's popping up, like incidental vocabulary or storytelling, um, video production, social media posting, anything could be used for formative assessment as, or, or what you call assessment for learning because it's the way I treat the information. So in my case, I would use these opportunities to think, all right, what can I do to help them? Um, if it's linguistic competence, can I create a new opportunity for them to practice these structures for them to retain the content better? You know, so that's basically assessment for learning for you. It's just like I, like I said before, you know, implicitly and inherently um, using information to the advantage of the stakeholders, uh, students in this case. What about role plays? I think role plays are perfect because um, you get to be in a different spot and that's empathy you know that's that's why it's good to act out uh because you're obviously gonna do like production right you're gonna create and you are someone else in a way so it's empathy which is very important social and emotional learning there you know uh, with uh, respect empathy putting yourself in somebody else's shoes so these things have to be contemplated. So role plays are great because that way you can have a situation where somebody will, will have to play a different role. In a way, for example, uh, if I am pro-healthcare, all of a sudden you, you can put me in a position where I'm against healthcare. 
and I would have to debate on it, or it could be just uh, presenting a, a, a topic from a different perspective, from a, a different point of view. So it's it's always uh, great for you to to use that tool in order for people to be you know more at ease, like I said, you know, and and, and create content that's um, helpful. Uh, sometimes we try to evaluate the parents. It's going to be an extra job supervising the kids. Um, yeah, now uh, I think Cholida, maybe, yeah, you're talking about parents and then you're talking about the other stakeholders, right? Especially when you have, you know, kids and the parents are very worried about the, the implications. So that's the thing. What are the implications? Well, you have social implications because you're dealing with kids who have to be prepared for the future, right? So parents are, they're truly concerned about the child's future. And the parents have been told a narrative that number-based evaluation is the way to go, okay? So in that fashion, in that case, um, they're gonna need that depending on the context. I'm, I'm just thinking about the various countries that we have here you're gonna to have to have that, but it doesn't prevent you from doing much more throughout the process. So that's 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 my point here. Um, yes, parents want results, and results. I mean, like I said, it's an umbrella term. You have a huge set of possibilities that fall uh, under or within results, but most of the time, common intuition, knowledge um, will go towards numbers and uh and summative assessment and that's that's pretty much the standard so if there's no way to to change that use summative assessment in order or in when you get to summative assessment you've already gone through various steps of formative assessment and even after the summative assessment you you can use it as information in order for you to keep working with formative so uh, just embrace it and expand it, okay? And slowly but surely, you can present the benefits of formative assessment to parents. I believe that by showing the benefits with students producing, by, showing, by, by making learning visible, parents are gonna be more understanding and convinced that, oh, you know, this is actually good. My kid is producing, my kid is creating content. I see, you know, here, it's not a number, it's just the project, but it is materialized and it's visible. So, you know, it could be a way to slowly but surely change how people see things. Um, assessment in writing. Scoring bands, numbers, what do students benefit more in terms of feedback? Yes, again, again, it depends. How, what are they trying to write? If it's for an exam, most of the time, you're gonna have two different situations. One, it's kind of more like um, a conversation between neighbors or a blog post or uh, an advertisement or something like that. And then a proper essay that you have to defend a point of view. But you have to remember that the exam is actually a standardized test that people are using either to immigrate to a new country or to uh, go to the university or to get a job qualification or to be able to work for future opportunities with jobs, right? So it's, it's going to be standard. However, so for that situation, yes, you would have to provide opportunities for them to be exposed and to practice. But again, that doesn't hinder, uh, that doesn't stop you from finding more opportunities to use formative assessment, even in those contexts. However, uh, with writing, I mean, if, if I have a student who's like, Alex, please help me with my writing. I'm like, well, do you want to write fiction? Do you want to write stories that you create? I mean, in terms of fiction, or you want to be like a journalist where you're trying to be neutral? I mean, what, what do you want to do with writing? You know, what's the purpose? Because human beings need purposes in life, right? Um, it, it's got to be functional. 
So if it's just the exam per se, um, they're going to do it and they're going to study the techniques. So that's, uh, I, I, in the morning I was just talking about it. I was just uh, saying that the technique plus the emotion. So that's why the tool plus the choice plus trust uh, usually will help you more with those situations. So yes, various uh, possibilities, you know, that's the thing with humanities, you know, it's always very hard to pinpoint just one answer. Dulce, hmm. regular school systems are open to these changes, are open. Um, depends on the country, depends on uh, the type of culture. So yes, no universal answer. Um, I would say to a certain extent, everybody's open, but we, as a society, you know, we have certain standards that are already there. And those standards are, they have to be met, the criteria, right? And then maybe 10, 20% can be changed. Let's see, it's always hard, I'll go with the flow may not be accepted. Yeah, that's a human, that's a human um, feeling in, in a way that we have, um, we want to be part of the tribe. We want to be part of the group, right? So it's like well, in those situations where you are with the group and then you say, somebody asks you a question, everybody raises their hand and you you really don't want to raise your hand because you don't agree, but then you raise your hand because everybody else raised their hands. It's compliance. It's a very basic human instinct in order for us to cooperate well with the band, with, with the, with the band of brothers, with your group. So you want, this is group identity in psychology, you know, and this happens with the school system as well, in a way. It's like everyone tries to go with the collective ideal, with the zeitgeist. And uh, that, that can be beneficial in terms of like evolutionary purposes. For sure, it's been beneficial. But at the same time, allowing people to think about this whole situation, about the fact that we're collectively deciding things, but at the same time, we have the paradox of being the individual, right? So it's, I mean, some cultures embrace more the collective aspects and some cultures embrace more the individual aspects but it's always this seesaw this scale um and, and with human aspects it's going to be like that so you're going to have to um you're going to have to what's the word you're going to have to well right now i'm not come not not really popping up the word it's going to tip of my tongue it's just out of reach. This is actually <laughs> an ad on YouTube. It's the tip of my tongue. It's just out of reach. Compromise. That's the word I was looking for. Yes. So you're going to have to compromise, you know. Um, let's keep on going. Feedback. Yes. So feedback is great. I mean, you can have feedback sessions. You can have periodic feedback sessions where you can treat for example, let's say linguistic aspects, you know, so you say, hey, for the past two weeks, you know, we've seen all these aspects. What were, what are your impressions on, on these linguistics aspects uh, in terms of your performance? I mean, this is just a talk. We're just, we're just talking here. Just give me your impressions, just self-evaluate. And then they give them their opinion. And then you say, hey, um, do you think we could maybe find a way to uh, have more opportunities to practice that and they're going to be like yes so what about so it's this nego it's the way you negotiate it's this constant negotiation that happens that takes place with students and teachers and students and students themselves you know with the interactions so um i would say that's that's the beauty of feedback sessions uh for learning so that's why formative assessment embraces those moments and you would have to contemplate that within the contact hours that you have. But even if you don't have the feedback like that, you could, because you don't have enough hours, you could ask them to do feedback at a later time and to and do, and, and do the ping pong as you go, like not really synchronous in a way with distance teaching, you know, but still it's an opportunity that's very valuable and it should be contemplated. Mm -hmm. 
let's check the time here. Right now we got, I think, 15 more minutes, if I'm not mistaken. So let's see. Okay, so someone is asking me about effective practices to assess speaking in B2 level. Okay, so I, I've worked as a Cambridge examiner. So basically, I would say just look at the guidelines and look at how the interactions are done, right? I mean, you have a situation where the student is going to talk for one minute about himself, right? So if this was a French lesson, I would be like, okay, hey, oh, salut, je m'appelle Alex, uh, je suis ici, très ravi pour être ici. I, I would practice my speech, my, I would consolidate my script. So that's the thing with assessment. You have opportunities to, to uh, consolidate your script because you already know what's going to happen. It's, it's kind of like... Uh, systematized. It's not kind of, it's actually systematized. I mean, you have other parts of the exam that are freer, but at the same time, you uh, you can practice, especially the, the, the first parts, right? Um, so I would worry about vocab. I would use definitely uh, Royce's book, Ready for First, because obviously you have all the skills there, everything, all the parts of the exam beautifully crafted. So uh, I would definitely practice that. Um, but but what's beautiful about this process is that I can be constantly thinking about using this information to a different outcome, not related to Cambridge uh, exams, not related to IELTS or whatever exam you want to do, but in order for me to help the student better perform in society. For, for, for the student to find opportunities to develop their autonomy, their creativity, uh, social and emotional learning, even with the technical aspects of um, speaking. Because, I mean, yes, it's a speaking situation that's going to be obviously rehearsed, but it's still talking about life. It's, a, it's, talk, it's beautifully uh, depicting interactions and shows pictures of people having a good time and enjoying life right and it's and everybody likes to talk about you know good things in life could be sports could be games you like to play or places you like to go like to travel entertainment right so yeah i mean just use the summative opportunities to work with formative to just pepper it you know little zest there. Uh, let's see, do you think it's good to use checklists or the lista de cotejo in order to assess online? Yes, like I said, you know, online is just a different environment, but we can adapt good practices everywhere and anywhere. So uh, the good thing about checklists is that you can have your skills there, like the Common European Framework does with the competencies list and you just check things and, and also you can have, like I said, the buffer with what is really good right now, what can be improved, steps for the future. You can really have more of a visual way to act, especially, and that's the thing, do I still have time to change things? This is the beauty of formative assessment. Do I still have time to change the game? Uh, can I still help them somehow? All right. Um, very good. So let's check a couple more. Let's keep going with the slides. My, my slides here are just for us to get things going. Um, so basically we've covered lots of, uh, we've had lots of opportunities to cover many, many topics. Let's see this one here. So that's the thing with assessment. Can you for sure know that everybody wants, all, all students want this type of assessment? It could be a great activity to ask students, you know, if they were to design, okay, if you are to design your uh, assessment, what would you do? You know, how would you assess people? So, um, they would be like, yeah, teacher, I would have like completely free assessment, you know, and, and that's the thing. I mean, sometimes people do that and you say, well, but then there's, there are no parameters, you know, then it doesn't move 
a society is not going to move. So there's no movement in life. We act because change is just part of the process. We're all changing. You know, time is a river. It doesn't stop. We're just tagging along. Uh, I agree with uh, Adriana. Par oh, it's par Parjikova, maybe. Each country has got various types of assessment. However, nothing is ideal. Totally agree, Adriana. That's the thing. We'll very rarely we'll have like a, a, a universal answer. You know, it's always going to be context-based context answer. So depending on the country, on the regulations, on how English is perceived in that society, English is the global language right now, right? So it's very useful for us to have this language in order for us to be part of this global community, especially online. And uh, so if people see the benefits, that's, that's the first thing. I mean, that's something that we can all benefit from. Um, and at the same time, we, we got to think about situations where we are uh, worrying and we are concerned about the stakeholders, all the stakeholders, not only government. So if government is one of the stakeholders and parents are the other and then institutions, what about the students themselves, you know, um, and how can we help with that? Because obviously we are already evaluating logical fluency and literacy um, structured tasks. Yes, we do that. I actually jotted down a few notes here that I wanted to, to cover and some of the stuff that we've already discussed. But it's basically yeah, adapting teaching. You know, um, we, we are always trying to adapt teaching when we uh, focus on um, formative assessment because that's the best way for us to change directions you know okay i thought i was going i was going this way and all of a sudden you know change of course um camila let's see shakes lamova maybe i think assessment is not perfect it doesn't assess the real level of student yeah so we'll never have a perfect situation right but we can have learning opportunities so we can use various types of either grading or opportunities, performance, projects, you name it, in order for us to have more learning opportunities. I think I got more here. Let's see. Uh, collaborative assessment. Oh, peer feedback. That's very, very good. Uh, Almeida. Almeida Bivnenko. Very good. Uh, peer feedback. Uh, you can get out of the spotlight for a little bit and you can have peers, students, um, evaluating and, and being honest, you know, hey, in your situation, I would probably do this, you know, in order for you to better go. Uh, and, and this is done with, you know, the CELTA, for example, right? I mean, we, we uh, whenever you take the CELTA or the DELTA, you're always checking with your peers how you can better perform. So it's, and the tutor is kind of like stepping uh, out of the, the spotlight for a little bit. So it's, it, you, you could do the same with the students. You know, you can have like peer reviews, you can ask people to contribute, or you can ask people to collaborate together um, at the same time with answers in order for everybody not to be shy, in order for everybody to share the load. So there are many, many ways for us to think about it. Um, Okay, um, Cyril Ordonez Montilla, Montilla, Montilla. Could you recommend us any resources to find assessment standards? Yes, yeah, so like I said, you know, you could check um, international curricula, various uh, international curricula out there. Um, you can check the Common European Framework for the guidelines, and then you would just base yourself on those guidelines. But I would say if you were to go, to, to towards a more like performance based type of assessment, I would just um, see what's available in, in your country in terms of like curriculum. Curriculum. Uh, I think Monica and okay, we've got seven more minutes just me, for me to make sure that I'm, we're aware of the time here. Um, well, tips for students with special needs, things like, you know, dyslexia, right? Uh, definitely, I would say formative assessment would be key 
in this situation, right? Because you would have to empathy, just put yourself in the student's shoes and see things from that perspective, from the perspective of someone who's really, um, someone who's there in order to, to, to experience things. Students are always experiencing things, teachers as well. So um, with formative assessment, you would have many more opportunities to adapt your teaching, teaching practice to um, better help students in different contexts and situations. So for example, you could create stations, you could have like a helper for the learner um, and various helpers and change roles uh, because we're talking about empathy and with empathy, you need to feel that you are somebody else. You really have to, to imagine that you're not yourself, that you're putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. So activities, you know, with various stations, collaboration, and uh, being part of this community, not really embracing diversity and, and changing roles. That way people are gonna be like, hey, I'm truly participating, I'm, I'm actually part of this. And everybody wants to feel that they can contribute, that they can share their thoughts, that they have opportunities to be creative, opportunities to talk about their personal experiences. Do you recommend the use of first language? Yeah, that was a question that popped up um, earlier today, and I would say yes, uh, but I, I understand that a lot of people believe that the, the uh, direct method is better, but I would say yes in a way because, I mean, that's helped me with my uh, with all the languages. I mean, I speak four languages, and I um, uh, many, many times I use the structure of one language to compare to another language. You know, like with French and English, sometimes when I say something like, oh, there's only one aspect here, um, uh, in French is a different type of construction, and I, I, I benefit from analyzing, you know, uh, languages like that because my brain is just overlapping them. And I, I don't see a problem, you know, I would, that's the thing. I, if you have like a moment to do that, even better. I mean, because we're talking about cognition and all languages deal with cognitive aspects. Um, parts of our brain, it's just firing up those, you know, neurons. And I would say it could, you, you could find ways to, to use, especially with performance, you know. Uh, the ways language cut information, you know, it's different in, within the spectrum of information. So uh, why not? Um, let's see what else here. Just for us to wrap up, eh? We got, uh, oh, thank you so much, uh, Barafesh Gafel. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate the fact that everybody is, you know, here. It was really, really um it was awesome. It was just stellar for us to, to have this moment and reflect. So that's the thing. As teachers, we have to find opportunities to reflect on our practices. And with assessment, it's, it, it's no different, right? It's, it's this moment where we see how assessment is done for the most part, and we just see if we could contribute with changes in order for more people. So it's always about the stakeholders and how people can better gain uh, either gain access, gain knowledge, performance, benefit from the interactions, collaborate more. All righty. Perfect. I will wrap this up with my info here. Um, please feel free to email me. Please feel free to add me uh, on social media. And I, I agree with Dusa there. Yeah, being a global citizen. So just finding your own voice by interacting with others. So thank you, Yanzer. Hi, Alex. Well, uh, it's been an amazing, an amazing job you have just made. Lots of thing, teachers are <laughs> thanking you. Uh, me too, by the way. Uh, you have been uh, excellent answering all the, all, the, all the ideas you had. Well, wonderful, believe me. Oh. 
Thank you so much. Muchas gracias a todos. Merci. Uh, thank you. Spasiba. I'm not, I, I'm trying to say thank you in all the, the languages out there, but feel, uh, feel the love. Thank you so much.